Hi everyone, it's Katrina, the antediluvian world. When we're talking about pre-flood civilizations, what we're really discussing is something called the antediluvian world. This world was supposedly composed of advanced civilizations that may have even surpassed our own. But when the Great Flood came, these civilizations were annihilated. Almost all traces of them were destroyed, and then the New World began. According to the Bible, it was God who sent the Great Flood to wipe mankind from the face of the earth. This was punishment for man's mistakes and sinful lives, and so these great civilizations were obliterated. There's obviously a lot of contradictory information. Scientists agree there was a Great Flood that could have wiped out cities over 2,000 years ago, and many civilizations have a flood myth. But there has never actually been physical proof of a utopian society or any kind of society any more advanced than we are now. And yet the people who lived in the antediluvian world were supposedly superhuman. It's said that before the flood, human beings lived to be about 1,000 years old. Also, people possessed a higher level of intelligence. There are even some theories that say the Nephilim of the Bible were actually the first humans to build civilizations before the Flood wiped them out. The People of the Sphinx Recent evidence has come to light that the Great Sphinx of Egypt may actually be twice as old as mainstream archaeologists believe. The narrative right now is that the Great Sphinx was built 4,500 years ago during the reign of Pharaoh Khafre and around the same time as the Great Pyramid. But it may have actually been built 7,000 years ago, long before any biblical flood. The Sphinx itself is formed from blocks of carved limestone. It's about 240 feet long, standing guard in front of the necropolis of Giza. Most archaeologists would say the Sphinx was built as part of the pyramid complex. But the pyramids may have been built around the Sphinx because it was already there. We know based on the erosion of the limestone that the monument spent at least 700 years buried in the sand. At some point, it had to be dug out of the desert sand like a lost artifact. We don't know if it was the ancient Egyptians who dug it out of the sand 4,500 years ago or if it was done later. Then there's the matter of the erosion on top of the Sphinx. It looks like the erosion is caused by rainfall, yet this type of erosion doesn't appear anywhere else in the area. That's because there is very little rain in Egypt. And so, if the Sphinx was indeed eroded by rain over thousands of years, it must have been built when Egypt's weather patterns were different. This would place it at a minimum of 7,000 years old. None of this is proven, and it's all mostly speculation. But if it turns out to be true, it would mean the Sphinx was built by an earlier, pre-flood civilization even older than the Egyptians. Under the Black Sea Scientists have just discovered the remains of an ancient human settlement hiding underneath the Black Sea. This is authentic, documented evidence of ancient humans who thrived on a prehistoric shoreline before it was swallowed by the Great Flood thousands of years ago. It was Dr. Robert D. Ballard who helped to discover the surprisingly well-preserved structure 12 miles off the coast of Turkey. You might not know his name, but Dr. Ballard is the same undersea explorer who used robotic devices to find the resting place of the Titanic. This guy is the one to call if you want something found in the ocean. An underwater robot was used to look about 300 feet under the surface when it found a rectangular area of collapsed wood and formed clay. This area was part of a settlement, and the sea floor was scattered with artifacts, carved wooden beams, stone implements, and the ruins of a mud foundation. The expedition was sponsored by the National Geographic Society as part of a project searching for human settlements that were wiped out by the historical flood. The purpose of this expedition was to find a pre-flood civilization, and they did it! The only thing now is trying to figure out who these people were. The experts had to look at seashells to help date the structure, putting it back about 7,000 years ago. That was about the time a significant change happened in the area, and the Black Sea changed from a freshwater lake to a saltwater sea. The only explanation is a flood, and that flood must have been huge if it buried this lost settlement under 300 feet of water. So I want to give a big shout out to Maggie Mae and Scared of Whales. Thanks so much for watching and supporting this channel. If you are new here, be sure to subscribe and join us. Tiwanaku. Machu Picchu may be the most famous place in Peru these days, and the Inca may be the most notorious civilization in this part of the world. But Tiwanaku was the real spiritual center of the Andes. 
It's in ruins these days, with very little of the old architecture left. And yet, what is still standing is quite important. It's useful to understand that just a few miles away is the legendary Lake Titicaca, home of many creation myths in thousands and thousands of years of Andean culture. This was the core of all religion and everything sacred in ancient Peru. The lost city of Tiwanaku is important because the structures remaining seem to have been built much earlier than other places in the area. There are the Puma Punku ruins, which were built with such impressive stonework, modern archaeologists don't even know how it was done. The stones fit so perfectly together, not even a piece of paper can get through. And then there's the Gateway of the Sun, which some believe used to be a portal to another world. Finally, there's the Flood Myth, the Andean legend of Viracocha, the creator god. The legend says that after a great cataclysm, when an enormous flood swept through the area and demolished civilization, Viracocha rose from Lake Titicaca to begin humanity again. It's basically the biblical flood, only told in South America thousands of years ago. There are some who believe that Tiwanaku was built before the flood and only survived because it was so high in the mountains. The Garden of Eden Gobekli Tepe is the oldest and one of the most mysterious archaeological sites in the world. Located in Turkey, it dates back to over 10,000 years old. This was definitely built by a pre-flood civilization. Some mysterious group of people, even before writing was invented, before the wheel, and before anyone knew how to plant crops, built a monumental structure. Gobekli Tepe is massive, a megalithic feat of architecture that even predates the use of pottery. This thing is older than any other man-made structure in the world. There are some researchers who believe it could be the actual site of the Garden of Eden from the Bible. Biblical researchers have long believed the Garden of Eden was somewhere near ancient Mesopotamia. And while there is no way to prove it, the pieces seem to fit. The complex is built of at least 43 different megaliths, huge pillars that are over 16 feet tall. Plus, evidence from geophysical surveys shows there could be more, as many as 250 more, lying buried in the dirt near the site. 10,000 years ago, this could have been the first temple of man, occupied only by Adam and Eve. If biblical speculation is to be believed, this could be the actual place where the first race of humans began before the flood thousands of years later. Atlantis The story of Atlantis is thousands of years old. It was immortalized by the Greek philosopher Plato, who described a city inhabited by a great and highly advanced civilization. This civilization became so advanced and so proud of itself that the gods smote them for their arrogance. They were destroyed in just one night by a great disaster. Within moments, the entire city of Atlantis was plunged into the sea. It's easy to see the correlation between Atlantis and Noah's Ark. We can also see it in the Hawaiian mythology of Nu, the Ark Builder. Almost every civilization wrote of a great flood and the rebirth of the world afterward. The story of Atlantis even fits in with the timeline of when that may have happened. According to geological studies, there was indeed a catastrophic event at the end of the Ice Age when the world could have been flooded. This would have happened about 11,600 years ago. The date Plato gives for the destruction of Atlantis is 9,600 BC, or around 11,600 years ago. Plus, scientists have already confirmed that physiologically and anatomically speaking, people from back then would have been similar to us. They would have had the same intellect as us. And so, even though we don't know if Atlantis existed, the whole concept of an advanced race of people back then being wiped out by a flood is plausible. Hi guys! Excuse the brief interruption, but I just wanted to let you all know that we are now on Spotify! Origins Explained is now available on the free Spotify app and Spotify.com, so you have even more ways to join us. Listen and follow along for new episodes every week. Check out the link in the description box and be sure to share with your friends, your family, your mom, your teacher, your neighbor. You get it. See you there. The Chitata Wall The Chitata Wall is on Hooper Farm, about 13 miles from Cleveland, Tennessee. In the summer of 1891, Isaac Hooper was out one day doing some work on his farm when he came across a stone sticking about six inches out of the ground. This was only one of many stones making up a mysterious wall that had been buried on his farm. He ended up digging the wall out and discovered a baffling length of stonework over three times longer than a football field. 
This thick wall in the middle of rural Tennessee seemed like it had no purpose. It was covered in indecipherable inscriptions. The Smithsonian Institution even put a small piece of the wall on display until 1902, when they decided to remove it. Now the wall isn't even considered a piece of archaeological history by most scientists. Those who see it as a piece of history simply say it was buried 4,000 years ago by the Native Americans, and that's the end of the discussion. Yet there are some researchers who have seen the hieroglyphics and believe them to be old Hebrew inscriptions. This would make the wall not a Cherokee relic, but one of ancient Israel. If this is true, that means the wall was built by a pre-flood society with direct ties to the Holy Land on the other side of the world. It seems like quite the stretch, though, and there doesn't seem to be much scientific interest. The Yonaguni Monument The Yonaguni Monument was discovered in the 1980s by a scuba diver who was looking for hammerhead sharks off the coast of Japan. The monument is enormous, covering an area of over 180 feet by 150 feet. It appears to be a sunken pyramid. The walls are smooth with various tiers climbing up to the top. Every single thing about this monument screams out ancient society. But mainstream scientists think it is just a natural formation. It's sitting on the floor of the ocean at a depth of around 100 feet. Nobody knows who built this monument, if it is one, or how long it's been down there. The government of Japan is not doing any kind of research, even though more recently, divers have discovered stone tools, ceramics, and what looks like other structures, and even roads. Some believe it was part of the lost continent of Mu, perhaps even Atlantis. Whatever it is, the Yonaguni Monument could be more evidence of pre-flood nations that were wiped out with their cities lost underwater. The Pre-Human Civilization the Silurian hypothesis suggests that long before human beings evolved, there was a different civilization living on the planet. This would be the ultimate antediluvian society, a race of prehumans who came not thousands, but millions of years before us. Some even believe there could have been a race of humans who evolved, went extinct, and then evolved again later into us. Gavin Schmidt, the director of NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies, asked, How do you know we're the only time there's been a civilization on our own planet? As reported in The Atlantic, when it comes to direct evidence of an industrial civilization, things like cities, factories, and roads, the geologic record doesn't go past what's called the Quaternary Period, 2.6 million years ago. If we are going back this far, we are not talking about humans. It could be an ancient species that rose to civilization, but even if an industrial civilization lasted only 100,000 years, 500 times longer than ours, there would be no evidence of it left. There is little evidence that this hypothesis could be correct, but there are scientific facts that say it could be possible. The question is, what impact or signs would they have left? And what will be left of our civilization millions of years from now? Genetic Entropy Genetic entropy is a terrifying subject. It's a fringe theory that says genetic mutations in human beings are slowly accumulating until we all go extinct. It was a theory first proposed by a man named Joseph Mueller in 1932. People living in the pre-flood world supposedly lived up to 10 times longer than we do today, and this all has to do with so-called genetic entropy. Starting at the top, Adam lived for 930 years. Noah then lived for a whopping 960 years. But after these guys, Abraham lived for 170 years, and by the time Moses came around, he only lived to be 120. Here's where this gets interesting. The rate of decay here is exponential, with a curve off by only a few fractions of a percentage point. In scientific terms, whoever wrote Genesis must have had a very sophisticated understanding of numbers and mathematics. Either that, or they were reporting legitimate facts. It might seem ridiculous to even entertain the notion that people could live for 960 years, but we just don't know what happened way back then. The theory is that in the pre-flood days, humans had no genetic issues that caused them to get sick and old. After the flood, that all changed. People lived too long, and it caused too many problems. And so the mutations came, and we lived shorter and shorter lives until the medieval days, when many people only lived to be around 30. Now it's going back up because of our medical technology, not really because of our genetics. The Sea Peoples The Sea Peoples plagued the civilized world during the Bronze Age, but nobody knows who they were. 
In fact, nobody even knows where the Sea Peoples came from. Just like the Huns, they seemed to be a nomadic people, but favored the sea instead of dry land. In the 13th century BC, an inscription was written in the Egyptian city of Tanis which said, they came from the sea in their warships, and none could stand against them. These naval warriors took their boats through the Mediterranean and attacked every coastal city they could find between 1400 BC and 1000 BC. For 400 years straight, a mysterious civilization who nobody could identify brought chaos to the Mediterranean. They sacked cities, forced entire civilizations to move inland to avoid them, and even led to the fall of the Great Hittite Empire and the Bronze Age Collapse, which was a sort of mini Dark Age in 1177 BC. Although we don't know where these people originated, there are a lot of theories. The Egyptians describe them as northerners, meaning they most likely came from Europe. They could have originated in Sicily or Turkey, or they may have even been the Philistines written about in the Bible. Whatever the case, something drove the Sea Peoples out of their homeland, and instead of building new cities and settlements, they lived on their boats and raided richer lands. They were basically Bronze Age pirates who had amassed such an unstoppable fleet of ships that they went on raiding until 1175 BC. That was when the Egyptian army of Ramses III finally smashed their fleet along the banks of the Nile and sent the Sea Peoples scattering. Byzantium Byzantium is one of the many names for what grew to be one of the greatest empires the world has ever seen. It was also called the Byzantine Empire or the Eastern Roman Empire. The history of this great kingdom goes back to the original days of Rome. It started out as a Greek colony, grew to be a powerful city, and then was proclaimed the New Rome by Emperor Constantine I in the year 330 AD. It was part of a strategy to better govern the Roman Empire as a whole. There was still Rome in the West, but it was experiencing some major difficulties. It was impossible for the emperor sitting in Rome to govern everything that was going on from the edge of England to their borders in southern Egypt and the Syrian desert. The empire was just too big. And so the empire that changed the world was cut in half. Just over a century later, Rome fell and Byzantium survived. In fact, the eastern half would go on to survive for another 1,000 years. It didn't fall until 1453, when the Ottoman army stormed Constantinople, the new name for the original city of Byzantium, and Constantine XI was overthrown. While the Roman Empire gets all the attention these days, Byzantium was really a much more successful civilization. They were the only empire that functioned as an organized state all the way from ancient times until the start of the modern age, besides China. Ancient Egypt People tend to think of ancient Egypt as one great empire that lasted over 4,000 years, but it can actually be divided into three very specific periods of time. There's the Old Kingdom, Middle Kingdom, and New Kingdom. And then there are periods that happen in between each individual kingdom, which were when Egypt was no longer functioning as a unified political power and was basically plunged into civil war. But we can go back even further to see what made Egypt one of the first great powers in the world. It all began in 6000 BC, or 8000 years ago. That was when the Sahara Desert went through a dramatic change. Some think the Earth shifted a bit, while others blame changing rainfall patterns. Whatever the case, the previously fertile plains of North Africa became a desert and human civilization was pushed closer and closer to the Nile River. The result was that people who would have been part of wandering tribes were now forced to live in the same place and rely on the Nile for water and food. This is why Egypt got an early start and how they grew to be so powerful. It was all about geography. That desert to the west that pushed them together also protected them from invasion. There was nobody who could march across the desert to attack them, meaning they could focus on building up their kingdom rather than fighting wars on all of their borders. The Huns The Huns were vastly different from most ancient empires, and it's because they weren't really an empire. They didn't have tons of great cities, we know little about their religion. 
As far as historians can tell, they never built any great monuments. The Huns were mostly a nomadic tribe. They were wanderers who rode around on horses. And there were a lot of them. What's really curious is that nobody actually knows where the Huns came from. They just kind of spawned east of the Altai Mountains, somewhere in modern Kazakhstan. The Romans became aware of them around the year 91, but they didn't appear to be any more of a threat than the other barbarian tribes. In the 4th century, that all changed. The Huns became the primary contributors to the death of the Roman Empire. They spread out from Kazakhstan and brutalized all the surrounding countries to the east. They were like a plague of locusts, only with swords. Their invasion was so severe, it caused a period known as the Great Migration, from 376 to 476. The slow onslaught of the Huns caused groups like the Goths and the Vandals to be pushed closer to the heart of Rome, as everyone ran from them, which was what eventually led to the Roman collapse. Still, not too much is known about the Huns. Writers from the Dark Ages describe them as bestial monsters and primal savages. But nobody really knows if these people were actual barbarians or if they had some class. All we know is that they came out of obscurity, got organized, and destroyed the civilized world. When their great leader, Attila the Hun, died in 453, his sons squabbled over the power vacuum left behind, and the nomadic tribe fell apart within about a decade. Big thank you to Shashi Oja and Candice Perry. Thanks so much for watching and supporting this channel. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos about amazing history. The Warring States of Japan Feudal Japan was hardly an empire, and yet it's worth mentioning purely for how unique of a time this was in Japanese history. This was the age of the samurai and the shogun. Samurai warriors became legendary fighters during the Warring States period of between 1400 and 1600. This was a time when the military might dictate who would be the ruler of Japan and who would be forced to follow. Samurai warriors pledged their service to a lord and were bound by honor to serve their lord up until the moment of death. For most of Japan's history, there was no one great ruler. There were clans and families that fought for power among themselves like a bunch of squabbling tribes. Whichever clan or family was the strongest got to make up the rules. This was something called a tent government, and it really began around 1185 with the Minamoto clan. Even though Japan was made up of warring clans and internal struggle, they were still a force to be reckoned with. When the Mongol invaders tried to enter Japan both in 1274 and 1281, they failed and lost upwards of 30,000 troops. The biggest power during the warring period was Ashikaga, from between 1336 and 1573. It wasn't until Oda Nobunaga, one of the great unifiers, went on a bloody campaign of ruthless violence to take down the Ashikaga shogun and unite Japan that the country was finally rallied under one iron fist. The Macedonian Empire Ever since the Republic of Macedonia was formed in 1991, there has been argument between Macedonians and Greeks over which country should claim the great history of ancient Macedonia. Because while ancient Greece may get all the attention in the movies, the Kingdom of Macedonia was the real star of the ancient world. They became the biggest empire on the planet. It was only briefly, but it was a pretty impressive feat. And it was all thanks to the great leader Alexander the Great, and of course, his father. These days, Macedonia is a small country on the border of northeastern Greece. 2,300 years ago, Greece was a political power concentrated in three main city-states. This was Athens, Sparta, and Thebes. Then came the Macedonian king Philip II, who conquered those three states and created a federation of unimaginable military might. What had previously been independent yet cooperative Greek city-states were now part of a single political life force. But it wasn't Greek, it was Macedonian. King Philip's biggest dream was to conquer the Persian Empire, which back then was the biggest in the world. But he was assassinated in the year 336 BC. When his son Alexander came into power, he was determined to finish the job his father started. And by the time Alexander the Great died in 323, at the age of 32, 
He had conquered everything from Greece to India, but because Alexander had no kids, his generals fought over who would take control of the empire after he died, and it immediately fell apart and crumbled. The Han Dynasty From between 206 BC and 220 AD, the Han Dynasty ruled all of China. They were the second imperial dynasty, but arguably had a much bigger effect on the country. It was the Han Dynasty that promoted Confucianism as the state religion, and they were the ones who opened the Silk Road to Europe. This permanently changed Chinese history, as goods flowed into the region in a way they never had before. The Han Dynasty was also behind a revolution of art and invention, and even created paper. The dynasty started following a huge revolt within the Qin Empire. This resulted in a brief dark chapter as the warlord Xiang Yu took over. But before everything could spiral out into chaos, Liu Bang seized control and the Han Dynasty was born. Liu Bang became known as Emperor Guozhu, and one of his first orders of business was to systematically depose all the kings of the individual regions in China. He then replaced the rulers with people he trusted from his own family. It was one of the most brilliant things a ruler had ever done, because it prevented uncontrollable rebellions from popping up throughout China. This gave the empire stamina to continue on for over 400 years. The First Persian Empire The Achaemenid Persian Empire was the very first real global superpower. It was founded by Cyrus the Great in 550 BC, and would soon extend all the way from Egypt to Asia and northern India. Cyrus consolidated his empire by destroying the Lydians, who had the Egyptians and Babylonians for allies. In 539 BC, the Babylonian Empire fell to Persia, and with it all of Mesopotamia. And in 525 BC, Egypt's capital at Memphis also fell to the Persians. The big thorn in the side of the Persian Empire ended up being Greece. They crushed the Persian invasion force at Marathon in 490 BC, and when the great ruler Xerxes tried again, he may have sacked Athens in 480, but his army was crushed at the Battle of Plataea the year after. For his failure, Xerxes was assassinated, and after that there were revolts all throughout the empire. This was the beginning of the end as things started to fall apart, because the empire was so big that individual pockets were able to rebel. And when Alexander III of Macedon came along, the Persians were finally crushed once and for all. The Visigoths, destroyers of Rome. The Goths came from somewhere, but it's not entirely known where. We know they were Germanic, and that their devastating invasion of Europe began in the north, as they pushed south and the Huns pushed west. It's possible they came out of southern Scandinavia, then grew in number around the Baltic Sea until they began migrating. Once the migrating started, the Goths split into two groups. The Visigoths were the western tribe, while the Ostrogoths were the eastern tribe. It would be the Visigoths who invaded the Roman Empire starting in 376, absolutely smashed them at the Battle of Adrianople in 378, and then burned Rome to the ground in 410 AD. With the biggest power Europe had ever seen gone, the Visigoths traveled to the region of Gaul, which is in modern France. They established their own kingdom there, took most of the land in Spain and Portugal, and fully ended their nomadic existence. They ruled up until the 700s, when the Moors came out of Africa and basically wiped them off the map. The Caliphate With the demise of the Prophet Muhammad in 632 AD, the world of Islam was thrown into chaos. And from this chaos came the Caliphate a religious political system that governed the Islamic Empire throughout all of the Middle East and North Africa. This religious government was ruled over by one man, the Supreme Leader, aka the Caliph. It was the Caliph who had the authority to take care of the Prophet Muhammad's great empire, and in the beginning, everything seemed like it would work. The first four Caliphs were actually elected through nominations and with the help of a very primitive parliament. The empire had control over most trade routes, which made them extremely powerful and wealthy. They were also famous for their organized military, magnificent cities, and promotion of the arts. Osman I began launching raids against the Byzantine Empire, and by the 14th century his descendants conquered Constantinople and brought the Byzantine Empire to its knees. 
They renamed it Istanbul and continued to expand. After about 600 years, the empire began to weaken and crumble and ended during World War I. The Algae Curse The ancient Maya suffered from a curse of toxic algae. According to researchers from the University of Cincinnati, ancient Maya cities had such bad pollution in their water that it probably swept away dozens of cities as they were crippled by a devastating plague. And it was all because of algae. When these researchers looked at the ancient city of Tikal, which was built by the Maya in northern Guatemala in the 3rd century BC, they found something shocking. They looked at the four central reservoirs from where the civilians would have gotten their drinking water. What they found was toxic levels of pollution in all four of them. It's already suspected that drought beginning in the 9th century helped with the depopulation and the later abandonment of Tikal. But thanks to this new study, it looks like toxic water making everyone sick probably had a lot to do with it as well. In fact, it would have been a pretty traumatizing event for the Maya, who didn't understand what was happening. Their reservoirs had been miraculous pools of life, which people could drink out of and stay healthy. And suddenly, they had turned into places of disease, and just drinking water caused them to get sick. Researcher Kenneth Tankersley says the cyanobacteria inside the water would have made it extremely toxic, and there would have been algae blooms right on the surface of the water, which would have been visibly poisonous. The Maya undoubtedly believed that they had been cursed by the gods, and when the city was finally nothing but a cesspool of sick humans, everybody left. Drought in Arabia 1,500 years ago, the Arabian Peninsula was hit by a devastating drought. This drought caused the collapse of the Himyarite kingdom, which created a power vacuum and led to the spread of Islam across the world. The Himyarite kingdom had an economy focused on agriculture. Their entire world was held together by an irrigation system, which transformed the deserts of Yemen into fertile fields for growing crops. This was what allowed the great kingdom to flourish for 300 years. But in the 6th century, they were struck by a curse there was simply no more rain. Between the years 500 and 530, these people didn't get nearly the amount of rain they needed to keep their agricultural system going. This led to unimaginable strife within the kingdom and had them being conquered shortly after by the Aksumites of modern Ethiopia. It was at the time that the Himyar were collapsing that Islam began to spread in earnest. Everyone in the region was so distraught from the drought and the war that people were looking for something new to believe in. It started in Saudi Arabia around 632, spread through most of the Middle East by 661, and had made it to as far as northern Spain by 750. Cursed with Neanderthal Gene Modern human beings still have a lot of the genes from our Neanderthal ancestors. Sadly for some, they have been cursed with a very specific Neanderthal gene that actually opens up human cells to coronaviruses and increases the severity of the sickness. This was just discovered during the COVID-19 panini when researchers realized that an ancient gene passed down through generations spanning hundreds of thousands of years was making some people sicker than others. Some may think it's a curse to be born with a gene for red hair or the one that causes male pattern baldness. But the real curse is getting the bad Neanderthal gene that makes you more susceptible to sickness. Here's the science behind it. Researchers say there is a small yet very significant number of people who have a certain gene variant from the extinct hominin called the Neanderthal. This gene variant doubles and sometimes quadruples the risk of major complications when infected with COVID-19. It all has to do with an enzyme called DPP4. This protein is what allows a coronavirus to bind with human cells, but those who have the DPP4 Neanderthal variant are given a second door into the cells, which allows for maximum infection. It's too bad there's no cheap way for people to check their own genome and see how much of their own DNA is made up from ancient Neanderthal DNA, because even though some people are cursed with this unfortunate variant in their genes, others are blessed with their own specific variant that actually protects against COVID-19, also passed down from Neanderthals. Confusing, I know. I wanted to say a big thank you to Caroline Cherizola and daughter and Scott Dunbar for supporting this channel. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos like these. The Black Death The Black Death was the most lethal plague in history. 
It's hard to even call this thing a curse. It was more like the worst event ever. The bubonic plague made its way across Eurasia and North Africa for over 200 years, between 1346 and 1553, and broke down 60% of the human population. To give you a rough idea of what that would mean in modern times, it would be like if around 4 billion people were killed. Those who suffered during these horrible days must have really thought the world was ending, or that they were in some kind of biblical apocalypse. The whole world had been cursed, and no civilization was spared. But of course, humanity recovered, the plague went away, and things got back to business as usual. Finally, after almost 500 years, scientists know exactly where the original Black Death patient came from. We're talking about patient zero, the one who started the whole terrible mess. Scientists have tracked the first case back to Kurdistan, to the region of Isik Kul. This was once a major stop on the Silk Road in the 14th century. There is evidence in the form of a higher number of burials in the year 1338 and 1339. This was about seven years before the actual plague outbreak. It looks like something happened in this region which started the disease, and then from Isik Kul, it spread over many decades to the rest of the world. The Curse of Cyprus In 2008, archaeologists found a bizarre curse inscribed on a lead tablet on the southern coast of Cyprus. The curse comes from the old city kingdom of Amathus, which ruled the island in the 7th century. While this curse may not have brought down any great civilizations, it may have brought down one guy who angered the wrong person. The ancient curse is about as simple as it gets. The inscription on the tablet reads, May your male part hurt when you make love. Somebody was obviously trying to curse a man so they couldn't be intimate anymore. The curse also showed the image of a man holding an hourglass in his right hand. This was almost like a warning, meaning the curse victim's time was up. According to Pierre Albert from the Athens Archaeological School in Greece, the curse is obvious evidence of witchcraft or shamanism. This is pretty remarkable because in the 7th century, Christianity was very much established in Amathus. It shows that even when Christianity was rooted strongly in one place, people would still turn to witches and dark magic when they needed to curse somebody's private parts. Rome's Volcanic Collapse there was a volcanic eruption in Alaska that probably erupted sometime around early in 43 BC. Scientists believe this volcanic eruption triggered a climatic event which hastened the end of the Roman Republic. This isn't the Roman Empire, but the Republic that came before it. During the years 43 and 42 BC, Europe and North Africa were unseasonably cold and extremely rainy. In fact, it was colder than it had been in 2,500 years. Crops failed, famine broke out, and disease spread. There was social unrest, political upheaval, and Rome was quickly thrown into chaos. The volcano that blew its top was Mount Okmok on Umnak Island. The eruption was so big and powerful that climate scientists believe it caused the temperature to plunge 13 degrees Fahrenheit for two years straight in the Mediterranean. This may not have completely crippled Rome had it not come at the wrong time. The Republic was already on shaky grounds and seemed doomed to fail. Political and economic trouble was only worsened by the curse of darkness and cold that descended on Rome and scared the pants off the citizens. They were so terrified by whatever was happening that the freak weather pushed everyone over the edge. Julius Caesar was assassinated by 40 Roman senators, and the Roman Republic was dead. The Curse of Akkad 4,000 years ago, the Akkadian Empire ruled over much of Mesopotamia. This was such a highly advanced society that they had roads spread all across the region and even boasted their own functioning postal service. The Babylonians and Assyrians, whose names you might be more familiar with, wouldn't come for many years later. And while those later civilizations may have done incredible things like invent geometry and look to the stars, the Akkadian Empire came first and laid the groundwork. For 200 years, they were the only power residing between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, in control of Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, Turkey, and Iran. But just like the Sumerians who came before them, the Akkadians were destroyed. It happened around 2150 BC, when the rulers of Akkad lost their power and the whole thing collapsed. 
Archaeologists typically blame the unsustainable conquest strategy of Akkad for their downfall. The kings simply wanted to keep on pillaging and conquering, and this caused them to stretch themselves too thin and crumble. On the other hand, it could have been a curse. Shortly after the empire declined, a poem titled The Curse of Akkad was written. It told the story of Sargon I's grandson, Naram-Sin, and how he plundered the temple of a weather god. It was such a despicable thing to do that the god cursed Naram-Sin and the entire Akkadian Empire to death. The poem says that after the curse, suddenly there was no grain. The skies refused to rain and the people grew weak from hunger. While this may seem like just a story, it could actually be true. The part about the curse is probably just flair, but the bit about the lack of food and rain could be historically accurate. It could be that Akkad collapsed because it didn't rain, and they all ran out of food. Comet Impact From between roughly 200 BC and 300 AD, there was a vibrant and unique culture living in the Ohio Valley of North America. They were called the Hopewell Culture, and most historians believe them to be the ancient ancestors of modern Native American tribes, like the Iroquois and the Algonquin. We know about the Hopewell because of the structures they left behind. All across the Ohio Valley are ancient mounds around 2,000 years old, and plenty of other artifacts. They were definitely here, and they were surprisingly sophisticated considering how long ago it was. But believe it or not, these ancient Native Americans may have met their end following a dramatic comet impact about 1,600 years ago. Their curse came from the sky. Researchers looked at 11 different archaeological sites and found fragments of micrometeorites. The only thing that makes sense is that these tiny fragments of meteorite rained down over the whole area following a violent airburst. One second, everything had been perfectly normal. The next, a giant piece of space debris exploded like an atomic bomb in the sky. Forest fires started immediately, crops were burned down, the landscape was scorched, and the Hopewell never recovered. The Björketorp Runestone The Björketorp Runestone can be found in the small Swedish city of Blekinge. It's by far one of the most ominous stones anywhere on the planet. It's also one of the tallest runestones ever found, measuring over 12 feet tall. It was made sometime in the 6th century, carved with a chilling message in the Proto-Norse language. Before we look at the message, it's important to know what runes were used for by the Vikings. These were normally tools to communicate with the gods. There are two different inscriptions. On one side of the rock is written something that translates to, I predict perdition. On the other side is what seems like a terrifying prophecy. It says something like, I, master of the runes, conceal here runes of great power. Plagued by maleficence, doomed to insidious death, is he who breaks this monument. And then a separate line says, I prophesy the destruction. Nobody really knows what all this stuff means, but it certainly doesn't seem good. In fact, it feels a lot like an ancient prophecy that the end is coming. Cassandra of Troy, the Cursed Prophetess Cassandra of Troy lived under a great and terrible curse. Cassandra was the prophetess of Troy, a character straight out of Greek mythology. In fact, we're not really sure if Cassandra of Troy truly existed, like many of the characters from the Trojan War, or if she was just a plot device. Either way, she was cursed with the gift of prophecy. The Trojan priestess was dedicated to the god Apollo and was given utter and true prophecies of the future. She was also the daughter of Troy's King Priam and Queen Hecuba, and her older brother was Hector. In mythology, Cassandra was coveted by the god Apollo himself. But when she denied him, he cursed her that even though she could see the future, nobody would ever listen to her. And so it was that even as Cassandra warned the Trojans that the death of their people was imminent, nobody believed her. Troy ended up being burned to the ground, her brother was killed, and she was taken away by the cruel Greek king Agamemnon to be his slave mistress. Although it's unclear whether Cassandra was a real person, she did appear a lot in historical stories, from Homer's Odyssey to Virgil's poem Aeneid, and this suggests that even if she wasn't magical, she was probably based on a real historical figure. Thanks for watching! What do you think is the scariest way for civilization to come crumbling down? Let me know in the comments below, and be sure to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. See you soon! Bye!